General James Dickinson, United States Army, to General Stephen Whiting, United States Space Force. The official party for today's ceremony includes the United States Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, and the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Christopher Grady. I'm Colonel Dave Stanfield, and I will be your narrator for today's events. We thank you for your attendance and support on this suspicious occasion. As a reminder, the ceremony is conducted as an indoor ceremony. During the playing of musical honors, military members in uniform will face the individual being honored and stand at attention. During the playing of the national anthem, active duty military members and retirees will stand at attention, while civilian employees may place their hand over their heart. Please stand for the arrival of the official party, playing of musical honors, singing of the national anthem, followed by the invocation. the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's a red glare, the bombs bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free? And the home of the brave. Would you pray with me, please? 
Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and the many blessings which are the evidence of your grace within our lives. As we witness this change of command, we're appreciative of leaders with high moral character who've answered their nation's call to serve. We've been the recipients of General Dickinson's vision and leadership, which has led to many successes which are evident across our military and certainly within U.S. Space Command. We will miss both he and Miss Angie. We are forever grateful for their commitment to this country, the mission, and their passion for both their families and our families. As General Whiting receives the guide on today, we ask that you bestow upon him wisdom, patience, guidance, and endurance as he assumes the commander of U.S. Space Force, U.S. Space Command. We ask for grace for his family during the exciting times ahead. Draw them closer to you and to one another. We thank you for our nation and the freedoms we enjoy. We lift to you the Marines, soldiers, sailors, airmen, guardians, coast guardsmen, civilians, contractors, allies, and partners who comprise the joint team of United States Space Command. And likewise, we remember our comrades in arms who are in harm's way this day. We are grateful that there is never a day without space available to them. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. Thank you to the 2nd Battalion, 12th Field Artillery Regiment, led by 1st Lieutenant Liam Houston for the Salute Battery, the United States Air Force Academy Stellar Brass Band for Musical Honors, Technical Sergeant Denver Murphy for that outstanding rendition of the National Anthem, and Chaplain Mark Thomas for the inspiring words, as well as the U.S. Space Command Joint Color Guard. We are honored to have several distinguished and special guests with us today. Please hold your applause until each group has been recognized. We have General Dickinson's spouse, Angie, their daughter, Deborah, and her spouse, Matt, and their children, Junior, Colton, and Reagan, the Dickinson's son, Hank, and his spouse, Sarah, the Dickinson's daughter, Olivia, General Whiting's spouse, Tammy, their son, Chase, and his spouse, Olivia, and the Whiting's daughter, Allie. Additionally, please welcome the Secretary of the Air Force, the Honorable Frank Kendall, the Chief of Space Operations, General Chan Saltzman, and his spouse, Jennifer, the Lieutenant Governor of Colorado, the Honorable Diane Primavera, General D.T. Thompson, United States Space Force, the Honorable Harry Harris, former Ambassador to the Republic of Korea, and the 24th Commander of United States Pacific Command, General Ralph Eberhardt, retired, United States Air Force and his spouse Karen, General William Shelton, retired, United States Air Force and his spouse Linda, Miss Natasha Hudson, Regional Director Pikes Peak and Colorado Business Outreach Director who is representing United States Senator Michael Bennett of Colorado, Mr. Antonio Huerta, Southern Colorado Regional Director representing United States Senator John Hickenlooper of Colorado, Mr. Dennis Heisey, District Director Director, representing United States Representative Doug Lamborn of Colorado, El Paso County Commissioner Stan Vanderwarf, District 3, Colorado Springs Council President Randy Helms from District 2, Colorado Springs Council Member Michelle Tallarico from District 3, Colorado Springs Council Member Mike O'Malley from District 6, Fountain Council Members Deetra Duncan and Jennifer Herzberg, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force, Chief Master Sergeant John Bentavigna and his spouse Kathy, and the Command Senior Enlisted Leader, United States Space Command, Chief Master Sergeant Jacob Simmons and his wife Anna. We would also like to extend a warm welcome to all directors, general and flag officers, senior executive service members, commanders, command senior enlisted leaders, joint, combined, allied, and interagency partners, community leaders, military and civilian personnel, and friends with us in attendance today and joining virtually.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated as Admiral Christopher Grady awards the Joint Meritorious Unit Award to United States Space Command. The award citation reads, under the provisions of Department of Defense Manual 1348.33, Volume 47, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has awarded the Joint Meritorious Unit Award for exceptionally meritorious service to United States Space Command during the period 29 August 2019 to 31 August 2022. Thank you, Admiral Grady. We will now commence with the change of command ceremony for United States Space Command. This transfer symbolizes the content continuity of command in the armed forces. Please remain seated during the change of command ceremony. The flag is the physical manifestation of command and will be passed from General Dickinson to the Honorable Kathleen Hicks, who will then pass it to General Whiting as a sign of the transfer of authority. Chief Master Sergeant Simmons, our command senior enlisted leader, United States Space Command, will stand as representation of transfer from the outgoing commander to the ingoing commander. The flag has been entrusted to the senior enlisted leader, symbolically expressing the special trust and responsibility afforded to United States Space Command's enlisted members. By direction of the President of the United States, General James Dickinson will relinquish command of the United States Space Command effective 10 January 2024. General Stephen Whiting is directed to assume command of the United States Space Command effective 10 January 2024. It is now my great honor to introduce the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Christopher Grady. Families and friends and members of the Joint Force, a very good morning to you. In 1962, on a very muggy day, in Houston, Texas, clearly not like the weather we have here, President John F. Kennedy delivered his famous address to our nation, laying out mankind's incredible technological and scientific achievements along our pathway to the stars. President Kennedy described this and described space as one of our great adventures of all time. And he declared that this was our moment, as he said, our moment for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to the future of the Earth. And so as we reflect on President Kennedy's visionary words and the great adventure that he preluded, let us look forward to the present where we continue to lead in space, thanks to officers like General Jim Dickinson and General Stephen Whiting. 
alongside the dedicated 18,000 members of Space Command, they exemplify our commitment to space excellence and leadership as we continue to pioneer new frontiers, strengthen our international partnerships, and safeguard our nation's interests in the limitless expanse of space. Now, before going any further, I would like to thank the state and local community leaders that are here today. It truly is a platinum partnership here in the Springs. You have provided unwavering support to our military members and our families, and you continue to foster those lifelong connections. Look no further than the two military families that we will honor here today. And I would also like to recognize our department and service leaderships assembled here, past and present. Your leadership, your mentorship, and your friendship continue to be critical to the success of our joint force. And finally, to the men and women of United States Space Command, thank you for manning the watch as we sit here today. This incredible team holds the ultimate high ground, integrating our premier space capabilities into the Joint Forces global operations, deterring the aggressive behavior of our adversaries, defending our nation's most critical assets, and when necessary, defeating looming threats. Certainly, recent conflicts have starkly illustrated the indispensable role of space in our nation's defense capabilities. And in my view, space has emerged as our most essential warfighting domain, integral to our national security, our coalition interoperability, and our global stability. And it is through our mastery of this domain that we gain unparalleled clarity in visualizing the battlefield, a perspective that is so vital for informed decision-making, for delivering precision effects, and ultimately for the multi-domain awareness that we need to defend our nation. And at the heart of this integral mission are the dedicated professionals of SpaceCom who make a profound commitment to the defense of our nation, our citizens, and our way of life. Equally profound is the commitment of their families, and I'm sure that everyone here would agree that our families are such an important part of who we are. And today, we start by recognizing two exemplary families whose honorable and selfless service, sacrifice, and support have been instrumental in the accomplishments that we are here to celebrate. So to the families, Although you may not have volunteered to embark on this journey as your service member did, you have served alongside of him as he dedicated his life to make our nation and our world a safer place. As a matter of fact, and in the case of Team Dickinson, I am not sure that young Angie Cole ever imagined that this handsome young guy from sophomore English at a high school just up the road here at Estes Park would have gone from band hall to football field to becoming her husband and partner for life. From high school sweethearts to now having been married for 38 years through 28 PCSs and three countries, Angie has been by Jim's side every step of the way. And while Angie has been an accomplished interior designer and a business owner in her own right, it has been her advocacy and her devotion to our military families that will be one of the most important Dickinson family legacies to the joint force. Across Jim's entire career, from the Battery all the way up to U.S. Space Command, Angie has served in and led family readiness groups, Gold Star family events, and so much more. She even wrote two songs, The Charm of the Army and Rolling Along with the Army with her sister Renee and two other military spouses as a way to celebrate the special qualities that make our families the very best in the world. And I know that she will be remembered very fondly around U.S. Spacecom for Popcorn Fridays. Across the country and around the world, Angie has served our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, our Marines, our guardians, our Coast Guardsmen, and their families, and the total joint force with wisdom,
kindness and a sense of adventure that is so essential to the nature of our military spouses, their families, and all of our care networks. So Angie, your services, your sacrifice, your support do not go unnoticed. So together, Angie and Jim raised four smart, talented, and successful kids. Their oldest, Deborah, is a first grade teacher, and her husband, Matt, is an infantry officer headed off to battalion command. Uh, this summer, they have three beautiful children, Junior, Colton, and Reagan. Next is their son, Hank, a custom builder, uh, home builder in downtown San Antonio, along with his wife, Sarah, who is a NICU, NICU yours, and they've got three kiddos of their own, Peyton, Riley, and Madison. And Olivia, a proud Texas Tech grad, just like the chairman. So I think you did that on purpose, Jim. I, I'm not sure. She is a news director for Channel 7 in uh, Denver. And then finally, the youngest, Joe, and his wife, Katie. I don't believe they were able to join us today. Uh, but what an Army love story that is. They went to elementary high school together at Osan Air Base in Korea. And as newlyweds, they are back in Korea, and in Korea where Joe is a warrant officer flying the mighty Black Hawk helicopter. And for those of you who don't know it, Joe actually got to fly his Black Hawk in the flyover as part of Jim's retirement ceremony. How cool is that? Did you make it through? Barely. Very good. So to the Dickinson family, thank you for your love and for your support and your sacrifices so that your father could serve our great nation with such distinction. You know, I firmly believe that family readiness directly contributes to operational readiness, that a stronger family means a stronger force. And so to the Dickinsons, you are the embodiment of that family. And Christine and I, thank you for your service. And on behalf of the entire joint force, thank you for your dedication and the many sacrifices you have made for the Army, for SpaceCom, and for our nation. Now, we would also like to welcome another tremendous fa a military family, the Whitings. And it comes as no surprise to me that two kids of two very successful retired Air Force officers might meet and marry right here in the Springs. Congratulations and welcomes to Stephen's dad, retired Colonel Larry Whiting. He's celebrating us with us today, and I think mom is out there in VTC land. I know how proud of Stephen both of you are, or of Jim, of Stephen, uh, 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 that you are, and I hope that you are enjoying your return to your old stomping grounds. And as for Tammy and Stephen, this will be, I'm told, at least the sixth time here in Colorado, but certainly the sixth different house on, uh, on Peterson. And along the way, Tammy has engaged in selfless work for our military families at each assignment, as well as being an accomplished travel agent, uh, agency owner, and an author. So together, Tammy and Stephen, in addition to all of that, have raised two great children as well, both with us today, Chase, a youth minister, um, uh, along with his wife, Olivia, and Allison, a technical writer, uh, also living in Nashville. We're also able to celebrate today with a host of Stephen's family, to include his brother, Stuart, and his wife, Misty Whiting, and his uh, father-in-law. So with that, how about a round of applause for the Dickinson family, the Whiting family, and all of our military families? <laughs> So, Jim, you have been an outstanding leader for the Joint Force at a pivotal time for our nation. You have served with courage and honor and conviction for nearly four decades in uniform. You've been selected to command our formations ten times, a true testament to your exceptional strategic vision, your unrelenting focus on mission execution, and your profound expertise formed through years of experience and superb leadership. You have brought an Air Defender's disciplined approach to this facet of our military. You have uniquely understood the persistent proximate threats posed by our nation adversaries, that winning in space enables multi-domain operations and the essential role of battle space transparency that shapes every future fight. And Jim, you will be forever recognized as the first 
Army Air Defense Four Star and the first Army General to command at U.S. Spacecom, or as Jim refers to it as Spacecom 2.0. Now the Army and the Joint Force haven't only benefited from having an air defender turned space professional at the helm, we've also benefited from having a true warrior with an engineer's mind breaking apart some of our toughest problems, exploring them from every angle, and advocating for solutions that are transforming the way our joint force does business. From hypersonic and directed energy weapons to the importance of low Earth satellites and space electric, electronic warfare, every one of these programs has Jim's fingerprints all over them. And of course, we all benefit from having served with Jim as a leader and as a mentor, and as a colleague, and as a friend. For me personally, that started with Capstone, where Jim immediately established himself as a huge intellect, and just as importantly, someone that you can trust, and that's someone you want to have a beer with. That continued when we were both Joint Force Commanders for STRATCOM. When Jim spoke, we all listened. And there was no part better partner to get things done within that most critical and crucial arena. So Jim, from me personally, thanks for your leadership, but really, thanks for your friendship. Jim and Angie, Jim and Angie will remain here in the springs where they plan to enjoy their downtime, relax, and maybe travel a bit, and above all, enjoy their dear family and friends. Again, Jim, on behalf of the more than two million men and women in uniform and their families, we say thank you. We recognize the impressive skills you have honed as an air defender, a space warrior, and a technical innovator, the leadership that you have practiced among your soldiers, your service members, and your teammates and the character that has been instilled in you from your family. These are the lasting traits that will remain as you close this chapter on your military service. And so as you embark on your next adventure, and as I understand from Angie, there will be at least two horses and a white cowboy hat. I'm not certain who's wearing the hat. I'd pay money to see you wearing the hat. But at least one white cowboy hat so that you can ride off into the sunset. I hope you do so content in the fact that you have made this great nation safer and more secure. We are so proud of everything that you have accomplished. You are a leader in the Joint Force, a brilliant mind, and an officer of true character and integrity. Christine and I congratulate you and Angie and the entire Dickinson crew, and we wish you fair winds and following seas. Now today, we will also recognize the Space Force's newest four-star, maybe the most junior four-star in the entire joint force, having been promoted today, I think, right? And um, who has just sworn in as the next U.S. Spacecom commander. Stephen is one of three of his classmates from the U.S. Air Force Academy having pinned on, uh, who have pinned on a four-star. Now, um, I know all of those officers, but I am told through very trusted sources that you creamed them in the class rankings. I'm going to tell them you said that, so you can deal with that later uh, as you go forward. I don't doubt it, though. So with Stephen, there was no one more qualified to lead space operations at this pivotal time in our nation's history. He has served his entire career as a space operations officer at the tactical, operational, and strategic level, and he is known as a dedicated, level-headed, and experienced space warfighter. To Stephen and to Tammy, and the whole Whiting family, welcome back to Colorado and welcome to this next incredible adventure. And truly, Stephen, your assignment to this command comes at such an important time for our joint force and our nation. In this complex global environment, the United States continues to lead across all domains and in upholding the rules-based international order. And leading in space, is paramount to ensuring that the joint force remains the most capable and most lethal military in the world. And as I've said, that starts in space. 
Stephen, I am confident that you will build on Jim's impressive momentum and carry us forward to new heights. So, as we underscore the significance of maintaining our leadership in space, I'm honored to introduce another tremendous leader within our department, Deputy Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Kathleen Hicks. Thank you very much. Sorry, they just have to remove a platform for the Vice Chairman. It's a little shorter than me. So uh, first off, thank you to Admiral Brady, General Dickinson, General Whiting, Lieutenant Governor Primavera, Secretary Kendall, General Saltzman, all the distinguished guests, family and friends of SpaceCom, and finally to all the people of the United States Space Command, thank you all for joining us. Many years ago, on a cold January day much like this, an Army officer led a team of engineers to make space history. You see, for centuries, humanity had looked to the wonders beyond our terrestrial home and only looked. Even as we invented rockets and radios and airplanes, we had yet to send a signal into outer space and be certain of its return. But the Army's Project Diana, led by Colonel John DeWitt, sought to prove otherwise to test whether radio waves could penetrate the horizontal, excuse me, the ionized layers of our atmosphere, reflect off something in space and be received back on the ground. There were no artificial satellites, so they targeted the closest celestial body they could, the moon. It was a bold experiment. Project Diana required building an antenna even wider than a three-lane highway mounting it on a tower 100 feet tall and using it to send radar pulses a total distance of over 470,000 miles from the Earth to the Moon and back. When they did, it only took two and a half seconds for the radio waves to make the journey. But in those two and a half seconds, the future trajectory of humanity shifted. Their discovery paved the way for space-based communications, reconnaissance, missile defense, navigation, and exploration from the moon to Mars and beyond. That happened 78 years ago this morning. So today, we honor the space achievements of another Army officer, and we ponder the future tra trajectory of his successor, and we want to be inspired by the lessons of Project Diana, how our actions today can change the course of history in ways we barely know and yield a tomorrow full of possibilities we can hardly imagine. Now, as you all know, SpaceCom is DOD's newest combatant command. And thanks to the hard work of its professionals, guardians, soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, civilians, and others, in four short years, this command has made tremendous strides. So let's pause for a moment and give that whole workforce a huge round of applause. Every day, SpaceCom delivers tremendous value across our joint force. With satellite communications, early warning radars, GPS that enable not only navigation for people, planes, trucks, and ships, but also the precision-guided munitions that have become a hallmark of how the U.S. military fights in the modern era. And those are only a few examples of what you operate. All of it matters. Because more than ever before, space is integral to military operations. And our competitors know it. They realize how much the American way of life and the American ways of war depend on space power. And they want to undermine our advantage here. They know it supports our strengths in every other domain, from land to sea to air to cyberspace. That's partly why our pacing challenge, the People's Republic of China, is rapidly expanding its space and counter space capabilities and integrating them into a broader strategy to challenge our joint force and undermine U.S. interests. It's why Russia has used counter space threats 
to bolster its attempts to thwart U.S. interests and those of our allies and partners. Both Russia and the PRC are evolving their military doctrines to extend into space. They're both deploying capabilities that can target GPS and other vital space-based systems. And we've seen both countries conduct operations against us and our allies and partners to degrade our space advantages. Our competitors' aggressive actions seek to turn space into a warfighting domain. But I want to be clear, conflict is not inevitable in space or anywhere else. And the United States of America is committed to preventing conflict through deterrence by making clear to our competitors that the costs of aggression would far outweigh any conceivable benefits. Everyone at this command is part of how we do that. Because while our competitors and adversaries see how much we rely on space, they also see you. They see the capabilities you operate most of them anyway. They see the vigilance you exercise 24-7. They see the expert skill and professionalism you bring to bear. They see the norms of responsible behavior that you've helped develop, promote, and practice, supporting the safety, stability, security, and sustainability of our space domain. And they see how you innovate to keep pace with rapid technological change. Our embrace of resilient space architectures is a vital example of that. For a long time, you could count our space constellations by the handful. Satellites the size of school buses that took decades to buy and build, years to launch. That was still the norm in the days of the old Spacecom. But now, we're also leveraging proliferated constellations of smaller, resilient, lower-cost satellites. Some launch almost weekly, deploying dozens of payloads each time. America's dynamic commercial space industry enables it, and it's also enabled the United States to significantly outpace the PRC's growth in space launches and payloads over the last five years. From 2019 to 2023, China doubled its annual space launches and more than tripled how many payloads it put into orbit. That's real growth. But over that same time, American space launches per year more than quadrupled, while U.S. payloads launched increased by nearly 13 times. In terms of scale, in 2023, the PRC launched 240 payloads to orbit, while our nation lofted more than 10 times more, over 2,500 payloads. And as DOD invests more in space, the whole of America's lead will only grow. We have all seen in Ukraine how resilient, flexible space capabilities can help a determined defender stop a larger aggressor from achieving its objectives. We're now approaching a future where the web of satellites we can draw upon is so great that attacking or disrupting them would be futile, a wasted effort, and a highly escalatory one at that. The United States is committed to leading with restraint and responsibility in the space domain and in every domain. We do our part to avoid escalation. We strive to prevent miscommunication and we work with like-minded nations to keep the space domain peaceful. And for the past three years, SpaceCom has led the charge under the steady and skilled leadership of General Jim Dickinson. Here's how Secretary Austin describes Jim's tenure. Under your strong and principled leadership, U.S. SpaceCom ensured that ground and space-based systems around the world were ready to keep our country and our allies safe. And your legacy as the first Army General to command U.S. SpaceCom will be a shining example for the next generation of military leaders. That is no small praise coming from the Secretary of Defense, who of course wishes he could be here today, and I know he is in all of our thoughts. I spoke with him just yesterday, and I can tell you he is on the mend, in good spirits, and actively engaged in the business of the department. 
So Jim, I know you've been relentlessly focused on getting Spacecom fully prepared to secure America's defense. In doing so, you've worked to put the right people and processes in place. You've deepened Spacecom's relationships with the services, your fellow combatant commands, and our spacefaring allies and partners, all critical for integrating our capabilities even more seamlessly. And you've strengthened how we collaborate with America's dynamic commercial space sector. That's also vital to our success. Your time leading Spacecom caps off an outstanding 38 years of service in the U.S. Army, and your wife Angie has supported you throughout. She's also been a familiar face at Peterson, striving to make military life a little easier for our service members and their families. Like all military spouses, Angie has served and sacrificed, and so have your four children, Deborah, Hank, Olivia, and Joe, and their families, and America is grateful to them. Now, Jim, you're an air defense artillery man. You've made a career working to protect against attacks from the skies, and I know that's been a vital perspective here as you've overseen the transfer of missile defense off support and planning responsibilities from STRATCOM to SPACECOM, bringing missile warning, missile defense, and space domain awareness together under one command. As you've seen at every step, Defending our nation requires the best technical experts and strategic thinkers. It requires deft organizational leadership that empowers our warfighters to do their best work. It also requires a willingness to innovate, to forge into uncharted territory, to reach further and higher to discover what's possible, and that is exactly how you led this command. As a soldier, you also know what it means to stand a post until properly relieved. Unfortunately, confirming your relief took longer than it should have, much longer. Last year's hold on general and flag officer promotions were unnecessary, unprecedented, and unsafe. They were bad for the military, bad for military families, and bad for America, and they should never be repeated. Secretary Austin and I are glad these holds have been lifted and we're committed to getting SpaceCom's leadership team in place as soon as possible. So Jim and Angie, just as the nation is grateful for your nearly four decades of service, we're also grateful to you for delaying your well-deserved retirement until your relief arrived. And today that relief is here. And as you pass the colors of SpaceCom to General Stephen Whiting, we know he will keep the momentum going. This isn't Stephen's first time at SpaceCom. He was at Peterson when the first U.S. Space Command was disestablished in 2002. But he was also present for this SpaceCom's rebirth five years ago. He was the first commander of one of its two functional components, and for the last three plus years, He's led Space Operations Command, which generates, presents, and sustains U.S. Space Forces for combatant commands. Despite 19 moves over three and a half decades, Colorado Springs may be his and Tammy's truest home for reasons you heard from Admiral Grady. But the Whiting family hasn't always been stationed in the Mountain West. At one point, Stephen served in the Pentagon as the senior military assistant to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. Now, if that's not a mark of distinction, I'm not sure what is. And while I can't verify this personally, I have it on good authority that some of his teammates back then predicted the humble, ever-professional, then Colonel Whiting would someday be the, quote, supreme galactic overlord of space. <laughs> Well, General Whiting, I don't think I can deliver on that, but Commander United States Space Command is pretty close. Stephen's time in the Pentagon was one of the few exceptions to his 30 years serving as a space operations officer. And in that time, he's witnessed the explosion of international and commercial space activity. He's described our era as the second golden age of space. He's seen the promise of this second golden age, such as last September's record-setting, tactically responsive space launch mission Victus Knox, which lofted a space vehicle just 27 hours after the order came, beating the previous record for responsive space launch by some 20 days. And he's also seen this era's 
potential for peril in space, like in January 2007, when Stephen was director of the Joint Space Operations Center at Vandenberg and on a small team that monitored in real time the PRC's hit-to-kill test of an anti-satellite weapon. That test created the largest space debris field in history, producing over 3,000 pieces of trackable debris that could, to this day and for many years to come, endanger satellites, spacecraft, and the International Space Station. That dangerous and irresponsible PRC test is partly why, in 2022, the United States made an historic commitment not to conduct destructive direct ascent anti-satellite missile testing. Since then, 36 other countries have made similar commitments. As Stephen later said, after watching that test unfold, we knew the world had changed. Back in 1946, those engineers on Project Diana could have said the same thing, and that goes to show how the fate of space is in all of our hands. Space can be a domain of unpredictability, chaos, and destruction, or a domain of stability, tranquility, and possibility. For the good of all mankind, the United States emphatically chooses the latter, and we strongly encourage all nations to do the same. No matter what, the 18,000 professionals of SpaceCom will be ever ready to defend American interests in space and uphold our norms as a responsible spacefaring nation. They are better postured for success, thanks to General Dickinson's leadership, and they will continue to thrive under General Whiting's command. So to Stephen and Tammy, welcome to an exciting new adventure. And to Jim and Angie, thank you for everything you've done for Spacecom, for the Army, and for America. We wish you both and your family all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ladies and gentlemen, the former commander of the United States Space Command, General James Dickinson. Well, good morning. Good morning, sir. Well, we're going to try that again. Remember, this is probably my last public uh, address like this in a uniform, and uh, we've always got to start out with a good Colorado morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. And maybe even a hua. hua. What did we do yesterday, Chance? Yeah. There we go. I heard it. So, well, good morning, Secretary Hicks, Admiral Grady. Thanks for those extraordinarily kind words uh, about me, the command, and certainly my family sitting in the front row. Uh, this is a bittersweet day for me uh, as I look to have turned over command to Stephen Whiting. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Stephen in a bit. But uh, what I want to do is I want to tell you that when I took this command, there was a senior level, very senior level leader within the U.S. government that uh, I was in a briefing with, and I said, stated my name, and I said I was General Jim Dickinson, the commander of U.S. Space Command, and that individual looked at me and he said, you know what, you've got the coolest job in the U.S. government, and I said, absolutely, sir, and so this has been a, a great pleasure for me to get the opportunity to command this remarkable organization. And the first thing I want to do is I just want to point to the service members that are in between the two sections of the crowds here and talk about them for a minute. I think there's roughly 40 of them that are standing before us today uh, from all the different services that we have to include the Coast Guard and to include our allies and partners. Uh, they represent the 18,000 men and women that serve each and every day and as we speak around the entire world. But what's also unique about them is they are a joint force and so each of them can come from a different service. Each of them even within their service could have a different experience in terms of what they do. What they do in terms of how is their experience in the land, air, sea, undersea and even cyber. Those are all represented within U.S. Space Command. And they're all exercised every day and conduct operations. And that is what has 
been our that has what has given us the ability to go as quickly as we have over the last four years in terms of being able to do space operations. And so bringing those skills, those combat experiences together in one single organization, coupled with some great leadership from all the services, from the enlisted to the officers, that is what the secret sauce is of U.S. Space Command. And that is why we are where we are today. It's not because of the equipment. It's not because of the machines. It's because of the humans that are able to do that each and every day. And it includes our allies and partners and our commercial partners as well. So let's give them a round of applause for what they do today. So when I assumed command in this very hangar three years ago, I said U.S. Space Command would focus on developing, cultivating, and embracing a space warfighting culture. I am proud of the strides we have made together and reflecting over a dynamic and active period in the space domain. I know every effort, every decision point, every initiative, and every trade-off was aimed at improving our ability to deter conflict and, if necessary, to fight and win in space. Our approach was iterative and inclusive, but most importantly, it was laser focused on improving our warfighting skills and instilling a warfighting culture in all that we do each and every day. Through this approach, I was confident we would meet our national imperatives and execute our unified command plan responsibilities. We developed and refined our intent, priorities, roadmap, and measures of effectiveness with the publication of my strategic vision. At the same time, as Dr. Hicks was talking about, the threat was still increasing every day. And the world has returned to strategic competition with increased complexity ever since I took command in August of 2020. So what I'd like to do now is, rather than go through what I normally do, which is a little listing of the threats from the PRC and the Russians, given the time, I'll just move on because I think Secretary Hicks did a great job capturing that. So when I assumed command in August 20, I said U.S. Spacecom would achieve and maintain space superiority by focusing on five key tasks as part of my strategic mission. First task was we would gain understanding of our competition by educating our joint warfighters on threats and adversaries and train them to outmaneuver our enemies. Since 2020, we stood up our intel enterprise by building our joint intelligence operations center. We integrated into our team the intelligence community's national agency reps, and we assumed the defense intelligence responsibility for on order space order of battle to enable decision makers with relevant and timely intelligence. We also stood up a measurements and a signals analysis, or MAZINT, where today we are the only DOD element to provide 24-7 analysis. Through these efforts, we have guaranteed that we retain our leading position at the forefront of technolog technological advancements. Increase the understanding of the competition by discussing the threat, as I did this morning and as StepSecDef did, is how it's growing at every opportunity and every engagement, both external and internal to the command. We created our deliberate processes using our joint fires element so we can message strategically during competition, which we do routinely to deter and so we are prepared to do so during conflict. The second task, we said we would build the command to compete and win by conducting operations, sustaining a warfighting culture, and adapting to a dynamic and changing strategic environment. Since 2020, we routinely respond to real world events by providing information assessments and recommendations on time relevant basis to our national level leadership. We've participated in numerous exercises where we tested our plans and new organizational designs. With the support from each of the services, we now have five service components. And in December, we completed our final reorganization by designating the commander of U.S. Space Forces Space as the Combined Joint Force Space Component Commander for Space Operations. This organizational design improved the unity of effort and the unity of command for our joint space operations and strengthens our partnerships with the joint force, allies, and commercial partners. The third task, we would establish key relationships by strengthening alliances, attracting new 
partners and enhancing interoperability and uniting around a compelling narrative. To that end, we now have partnerships with 33 nations and international organizations. We have enhanced space cooperation MOUs with the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. We have benefited from representations from Australia, Canada, the UK, Japan, Germany, and France in our headquarters as well, out, as, well as out at Vandenberg. We have established joint integrated space teams and each combatant commander to enable effective space integration into their plans, exercises, and operations. And last June, I had the privilege of traveling to Europe to speak with the NATO military committee. It was a fantastic opportunity and not too bad of a TDY to discuss the space and the challenges we face with all 31 member nations. The fourth task, we said we would maintain digital superiority through innovating for a competitive advantage, evolving cyber operations for an agile and resilient posture, and investing in game-changing technologies. So since 2020, we improved our integration with U.S. Cybercom by building our joint cyber center and we have further improved our cyber posture by having two of our five service components dual-hatted as both a, a space command service component and a cyber service component. And finally, fifth, we would integrate commercial and interagency or, inter organizations to promote responsible behaviors in space, advocate for greater space capabilities, and collaborate to solve mutual challenges with all elements of national power. And today, we now have 139 commercial partners, which are critical to our operations and our planning as we make advancements with cutting edge technology like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And our joint commercial operations cell has more than 28 commercial partners focused on space domain awareness capability, capacity, and data sharing. So our success to this point is dependent on the strength of our relationships with the joint force our interagency allies, inter allies and partners in industry as well as academia. Since 2020, we have achieved a number of critical milestones through the diligent efforts of the devoted military and civilian space professionals of this command. We established U.S. Space Command Headquarters command and control capabilities. We formed a comprehensive network of allies and partners around the world working toward common goals through the Combined Space Operations Board as well as Op Operation Olympic Defender. We built strategies for commercial integration, academic partnerships, as well as human capital. And we developed specific, specific tenets of responsible behavior, making the domain more safe, secure, and sustainable. And we developed our operational plans that were approved and are now being exercised routinely. All to say that we are ready and can effectively execute our unified command plan responsibilities. So, today is the day we have turned over the reins to General Stephen Whiting, and that sounds good, General Stephen Whiting, and he, I believe, is uniquely qualified to lead this command. A master at tactics and technical skills, command experience at every level, a leader who is a servant leader, and a leader who is compassionate and strong. Of course, he's extremely familiar with all the issues and aspects of U.S. Space Command based off the fact of his vast experience in space as well as just being the previous SPOC commander. And so, Stephen and Tammy, congratulations. Angie and I wish you all the very best as you assume the helm of U.S. Space Command and the 18,000 service members that comprise the command. I want to thank, uh, spa say special thanks to uh, Secretary Esper, Secretary Austin, Secretary Hicks, Generals Milley and Brown, Admiral Grady, for you the opportunity of a lifetime to stand up a combatant command. And believe it or not, there's no playbook that says, what do you do to stand up a combatant command? Thanks to my service component commanders, Lieutenant uh, General Dan Carbell, who is now retired, Lieutenant General Sean Ganey, congratulations on your promotion and assuming command as recently as yesterday, along with uh, Lieutenant General Stephen uh, Nordhaus, Vice Admiral Craig Clapperton, Major General Ryan Heritage, Lieutenant General Doug Schess. I want to thank my staff at U.S. Space Command, Rear Admiral Pennington, Colonel Dave Stanfield, our, na our narrator today, Brigadier General Sid Sidari, Major General Krusty Endicott, Colonel Sean Shane Cuellar, 
as well as Major General Gibson, Mr. Yu, and Mr. Lockhart. To my special staff in front office, Colonel Megan Schaefer, Colonel Bobby Hall, Colonel Chris Buckley, and Colonel Rake Alvarez. And a big thanks to the gentleman sitting right over here in the front row, my command senior enlisted leader, Jake Simmons. And my final thanks and the most important thanks is to my family and thank you for all the things that's sitting there in the front row. Uh, couldn't have done it without my great kids, uh, Deborah, Hank, Olivia, and Joe. Joe can't be here because he's flying helicopters around Seoul, South Korea. It's probably midnight his time. But uh, and to their spouses, thank you, Matt, Sarah, and Katie for your incredible support. And my final thank you is to Angie. So 38 years, uh, can't thank you enough. You know how much I love you. Uh, it has been a great ride, 38 years of uh, military life. I don't know what we're going to do when I retire. It's going to be a different life, but I'm excited to be able to do it with you. And so in a few minutes, I look forward to driving off into the sunset and doing something different. So in closing, I would just say U.S. Space Command is ready today to face an ever-changing and complex strategic environment and to protect and defend the space domain for the nation, our allies, and partners. I'm honored and humbled to have served as the commander of U.S. Space Command. You are the greatest asset, are the people within this command, and gives us the greatest advantage over our competitors. And it's because of you, the 18,000 warfighters serving around the world today, U.S. Space Command will employ our nation's joint military space power to ensure there's never a day without space. Thank you very much. On behalf of the command, we would like to present Ms. Angie with red roses in recognition for her devotion and dedication to the service members and families of the United States Space Command. Red is the color of the heart and reflects the loving concern that Mrs. Dickens has shown for the Space Command and their families. Her roses are in full bloom, symbolizing the beauty and fulfillment of her time with the United States Space Command. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the Commander, United States Space Command, General Stephen Whiting. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for taking time to attend this ceremony. The last 24 hours have been like a protocol of Palooza here at Peterson, and I appreciate the entire joint team who has put this first class event together. Tammy and I are grateful to Secretary Austin and Chairman Brown for their unwavering support of this command and thankful to Secretary Hicks and Admiral Grady for not only traveling to represent them here today but also for their vital leadership of the department and the entire joint force. To Jim and Angie Dickinson, thank you for your outstanding leadership of this command and for your backing and friendship to Tammy and I during our many years of service together. Under your leadership, this command has solidified its place as an indispensable warfighting teammate with our sister combatant commands and partners around the world. You have led U.S. Space Command to achieve full operational capability and placed us on a path to now focus all our energies on our core operational missions. To our community and civic leaders of the state of Colorado and the Front Range, thank you for your unwavering support for United States Space Command, to all the military commands in the local area, and to all the families and veterans who proudly call Colorado Springs home. It is a pleasure to live here in the Pikes Creek region, even on chilly mornings like today. And most importantly, thank you to my beloved family, Tammy, Chase, Olivia, Allie, my parents, brother, 
sister-in-laws, my in-laws, all of you, and to all our dear friends in Colorado Springs and around the world. Tammy and I were both born into military families, and we thank our parents for demonstrating to us a love for and commitment to serve our, our nation. We can't begin to express our gratitude. We know we would not be here today without your support, loyalty, and love through the orbits of our life. To take command at this historic point is a humbling and sobering experience. As a duly cadet at the Air Force Academy in 1985, me and my classmates were required to memorize three current event articles from the newspaper each morning and to recite them when directed by an upper class cadet. This was meant to teach us that leaders must know and understand the environment in which they are entrusted with leading our nation's citizens. And that's an expectation I still carry for myself today. And I specifically recall that on September 24th, 1985, I memorized the particulars of an article about the establishment of a new joint U.S. Space Command being stood up at then Peterson Air Force Base the day prior. And I recall thinking, I'd like to serve in that command one day. Well, I've gotten my chance. And my career has continued to intersect with this command for over 38 years. On October 1st, 2002, as a lieutenant colonel, Assigned to U.S. Space Command, as the Deputy Secretary mentioned, I sat in this very hangar about where Bill Wolf is sitting right there and watched as General Eberhardt, sir, thank you for being here, cased the flag of U.S. Space Command 1.0. And then I watched as the space mission transferred to U.S. Uh, Strategic Command, and I actually followed it to Omaha a few months later with a very small but dedicated core of space professionals. Then on August 29, 2019, I was sitting in the White House Rose Garden and witnessed this new iteration of U.S. Space Command be established as General J. Raymond took the reins as the commander. During that time, as the Secretary noted, I was honored to serve as the first commander of one of U.S. Space Command's two functional commands, and I'm proud to serve again in Space Command with the first commander of the other functional component command from that time, Lieutenant General Tom James, who is now our deputy commander. Fast forward to this same hangar, August 20th, 2020, when Tammy and I had the pleasure to witness General Raymond pass the flag to General Dickinson. And now I am a bit stunned and as surprised as you are to be here today with all of you receiving these colors from General Dickinson. I can assure you, while Cadet 4th Class Whiting might have wanted to serve in this command one day, he never would have dreamed he'd be on this stage. Leadership of America's military daughters and sons is a most sacred trust. And it is my distinct honor to be entrusted with leading the patriots of this command. I have a sober appreciation of the tremendous responsibilities placed on our shoulders to ensure that space remains a sustainable, safe, stable, and secure domain for all humankind. Our highest priority is to preserve freedom of action in space. And our moral responsibility is ensuring delivery of space capabilities to the joint force to en enable all domain dominance, to protect the joint force from space-enabled attack, and to lead and win the space fight by achieving space superiority. The People's Republic of China and Russia consider space a warfighting domain, and their increasingly assertive actions have made space more contested. Their actions have created real threats to our national space power and the critical space infrastructure upon which our nation relies. This reaffirms my conviction of the importance of the services developing world-class space forces to include both warfighters and systems. For instance, with the stand-up of U.S. Space Force four years ago, we now have a service dedicated to organizing, training, and equipping forces focused on the space domain. And in doing so, building guardians who spend their careers mastering the distinctive aspects of space. And given this unique pairing of a service and a combatant command focused on that realm 100 kilometers above us and extending to the edge of the universe, partnership between U.S. Space Command, employing space power, and Space Force must be communicative, collaborative, and cooperative. No doubt, there are tensions between services and combatant commands, but that's natural based on the very design of Goldwater Nichols. But let me be clear maximizing the outcomes for the nation in space ahead of any organizational equities will be my priority. We will succeed together. For U.S. Space Command to achieve our mission requirements, we must maximize the joint nature of our command. In addition to the Space Force, the Army, the Navy, 
the Marine Corps, and the Air Force all bring unique capabilities and expertise to our combatant command, and we cannot fulfill our unified command plan tasks without them. Soldiers, sailors, Marines, airmen, and Coast Guard Guardsmen also help keep us laser focused on the foundational responsibility of enabling joint force lethality and effectiveness. Said plainly, U.S. Space Command will not be successful without the contributions of all the services. To the Secretary, Deputy Secretary, Chairman and Vice Chairman, I will ensure this command continues to provide no-fail space capabilities to the joint force through all levels of conflict. Space Command, having recently achieved full operational capability, will focus all of our energies on refining our performance of our warfighting missions and unified command plan responsibilities. We will provide a formidable deterrent against potential adversary aggression, and we will be prepared to win across all levels of conflict through the employment of military space power and integrated trans-regional missile defense support capabilities, while maximizing our partners with allies, coalition members, our interagency teammates, commercial industry, and academia. To that end, I pledge to work closely with our allies and partners to protect our nations and to succeed in space together. No single nation, command, military service, department, or agency can succeed alone in space. Space is a team sport, and I promise that this command will be a good teammate with all of our stakeholders. Together, we will continue to build our competitive advantage for the nation. And to the soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, Coast Guardsmen, civilians, and contractors of this command, I commit to lead you in a positive, collaborative manner and to provide you with clear warfighting objectives you need to enable unified action. The strength of any military formation is its people, and the Joint Space Warfighters of this command are the best in the world because of their demonstrated professionalism, expertise, and unique backgrounds. Together, we will fulfill our promise to the citizens of the United States and our allies to ensure that there will never be a day without space. I look forward to serving with all of you. Thank you again for being here today, and may God bless United States Space Command and the United States of America. Thank you. Welcome you and your family with open arms and look forward to the future. As part of that welcome, we would like to present Mrs. Whiting with a bouquet of yellow roses welcoming her to United States Space Command. Yellow is the color of friendship and in time the rose buds will blossom as will Mrs. Whiting's relationship with U.S. Space Command and their families. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand for the playing of the Armed Services Medley by the United States Air Force Academy Band Stellar Brass, followed by the departure of the official party.
Thank you for joining us today. There will be a receiving line to extend our congratulations to General Whiting and his family and to bid Godspeed to General Dickinson and his family, followed by a welcome reception here in the hangar. Thank you.